What's that? Right. Just obeying the command. Okay, good evening, everybody. So again, we're going to break the chain tonight, going to veer off topic. But tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, so it makes a lot of sense. I want to accomplish a couple different things. The first is, there's a fundamental question, um, even regardless of Hanukkah, but philosophically, why and when do miracles happen? We read about them in the Tanakh. Is there any common thread that explains why a miracle would take place? So I'd like to address that question. I'd also like to address a very major issue with the entire Hanukkah celebration. If you look at it in the scope of history, and you ask the question, what really happened? So it's true, we kicked out the Greeks, and we got the temple back, and we regained control of Jerusalem. How long did it last? We were there for a little more than 200 years afterwards. And those 200 years were tumultuous. They were very difficult. Internal conflict and external conflict. The Romans come in 200 years later, destroy the temple. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are killed and exiled. So what are we celebrating? We won the battle, but we lost the war. So we gained 200 more years, but then we lost. So what exactly is, is the celebration of Hanukkah? What I'd like to do is go back into history and get a little bit of the scope leading up to the revolt of the Maccabees. Because often we have that little slice, that little moment in time that we hear about in elementary school, and that's all we know for the rest of our lives. But to see it in perspective of what led up to those events and what happened afterwards, I think is very meaningful. So we're going to run back to the time of Philip II. Philip II of Macedon was in control of all of Greece. This is after the Peloponnesian War that lasted about 30 years between Sparta and Athens, a devastating war. Philip II comes into power, and he's very idealistic. He's an ambitious fellow, and his goal is to invade Persia. Persia was the world power at that time. I had to get the flow of the different world powers. We have Egypt. Eventually, uh, Babylonians take out the torch. Persians take over after the Babylonians. And at this point in time, Philip wants to defeat the Persian Empire and make Greece the end all and be all. However, he's assassinated before he gets the chance to do so. Different theories out there. Maybe it was his son Alexander who was responsible for his death. Not clear. Alexander takes over as a very young man. We all know Alexander the Great. He reigns for 12 years. He leads 45,000 men and defeats Persia within three years. He becomes the, the undisputed leader of the entire known world at that time. From Egypt to India, the world was his. At what age does he pass away? Anybody know of hand? 29, 32, around there. Alexander passes away as a young man. Now there was a point where Alexander had in mind to destroy the temple based on the Samaritans coming to him and saying, these Jews are not supporting your campaign. And the reason they did not support the campaign is because they were allies with Persia. So they declined. We said, we can't help you. We have an agreement with Persia. The Samaritans come, who hate the Jews anyways, and they tell Alexander, the way to get them back is by destroying their temple. The Talmud and Josephus both relate an um, interesting little episode in history where they're on their way to destroy the temple. Alexander gives permission to the Samaritans to do so. Shimon HaTzadik, he was the Kohen Gadol, he was the leader of that time. He hears about it, he comes with his entourage, they meet up with Alexander, 
And right then, Alexander gets off his chariot and he bows down to Shimon, the leader of the Jewish people. Everyone is shocked. Who else did Alexander bow down to in his lifetime besides Shimon HaSadik? Nobody. What are you doing? You're the, the king of the world bowing down to this Jew with the beard, wearing the, the garb of the Kohen Gadol, of the high priest. And Alexander said, it's an amazing thing. Every time I go into battle, the night before I have this dream, and I have this image of a man standing there wearing these clothing, and it looks like this person. And that always gave me the confidence to go into battle. So that was 180. He changes his mind, and based on that episode, the Jews are very friendly with Alexander. He spares the temple. And that year, the Jews actually agree to name every Jewish boy Alexander. And that's how the name crept into Judaism. What is the Yiddish equivalent to Alexander? There is. Really? Sender. Oh, sender. Sender in Yiddish comes from Alexander. So the relationship between the Greeks and the Jews at that point in time was OK. Alexander passes away as a young man. And now you have three different kingdoms, really. You have the Northern Kingdom. You have, that's the Seleucid or the Assyrian Greeks. You have the Southern Kingdom, the Ptolemaic Empire, which is where Egypt is. And then you have Macedon, where Sparta and Athens are. Three different kingdoms within Greece. And that's never pretty. There's internal fighting. Initially, the Jews fall under the control of Ptolemy, the southern emperor. And things go pretty well to the extent where the Hellenism of the Greeks really creeps into the Jewish lifestyle. And there's an entire community in Alexandria, in Egypt, where they all speak Greek. They're part of the culture. They have a big, massive synagogue. And in Jerusalem as well, the ways of the Greeks are really enticing and attracting the Jews. I'd like to read you one paragraph here from 1 Maccabees. We mentioned, I think, before the Apocrypha, works that were not included in the Bible itself, in the Tanakh. Nevertheless, Maccabees is known as a fairly authentic historical uh, documentation. This is the earliest we have, the earliest record we have of what took place in the times of the Maccabees. At that time, lawless men arose in Israel and seduced many with their plea. Come, let us make a covenant with the Gentiles around us, because ever since we have kept ourselves separate from them, we have suffered many evils. Does that line ring a bell? It's been echoed throughout history. Everywhere we are, if we're more similar and we embrace their culture and we look like them and we speak like them, then they'll like us. The plea got so favorable a reception that some of the people took it upon themselves to apply to the king who granted them liberty to follow the practices of the Gentiles. Thereupon, they built the gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the customs of the Gentiles and underwent operations to disguise their circumcision, rebelling against the sacred covenant. They joined themselves to the Gentiles and became willing slaves to evil doing. To build the gymnasium in Jerusalem is pretty much the same thing as bringing the statue of Zeus into the temple. Good evening. We saved many latkes for you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Where does the word gymnasium come from? It comes from gumnos in Greek means nude or naked, because that's how they would practice their athletics, in the nude. Why would they do that? Because they were too cheap to buy shorts. <laughs> Not quite. Because they worshipped the human body. To Greek civilization, 
the beauty, the accomplishment, the grandeur of the human being was the most holy thing in the world. Ken Spiro has a very nice line where he contrasts the Jewish worldview to the Greek worldview. He said, to the Greeks, that which was beautiful was holy. To the Jews, that which was holy was beautiful. So although very different in culture, very different in what we view as true beauty, it was attractive. The art, the theater, the literature, the architecture, to the extent where they underwent operations to disguise their circumcision. We want to blend in. Now, as this is happening, the leader of the Northern Empire is a man named Antiochus. Antiochus comes into power, and he's also an ambitious fellow. He wants to invade the Southern Kingdom and take all of Greece for himself. So he does so. To get to the Southern Kingdom, you have to go through Israel. On his way back, he tells the Jews, you can no longer practice your religion. You can no longer do the ritual of circumcision. You could no longer observe Shabbat or holidays. Again, I'll read you a couple of lines from Maccabees. The king wrote to all his kingdom, for all to become one people and for each to abandon his own customs. All the Gentiles agreed to the terms of the king's proclamation. Many Israelites, too, accepted his religion and sacrificed to idols and violated the Shabbos. The king's letter went out to all Jerusalem. The punishment, if any Jew was caught teaching Torah, doing a circumcision, keeping the Shabbos, was death. The book of the Maccabees relates that women who had their sons circumcised were put to death according to the decree, hanging the babes from their mother's necks and executing also their husbands and the men who had performed the circumcisions. Many Israelites strongly and steadfastly refused to eat forbidden food. They chose death in order to escape defilement by foods and in order to keep from violating the Holy Covenant. And they were put to death. Indeed, very great wrath had struck Israel. So it's much more than the Greeks come in and they put the statue of Zeus in the temple and they take over. Do we have like a Hanukkah melody maybe? <laughs> this was ISIS. This was terrorism. They were killing mothers and hanging their children. Now, on one hand, this was living in hell. What do you do? You're one of the Jewish people living in this time period, um, second century BCE, and you have a choice. Do we agree to all the restrictions placed upon us by Antiochus and just become one of his people? and forget about Judaism? Or do we fight to the death? Do we risk our lives and our children's lives to stand up for what we believe to be truth? That's a very difficult question. The way it's portrayed here is that the choice of many was, I'm not risking my life. I love Judaism. I love latkes, but um, I love my life more than that. So they blended it, they assimilated. However, we have something within us which is a negative and a positive, which we see all throughout the Torah. We're criticized for this. At the same time, it's probably the source of our survival. We're stubborn. Until Antiochus comes into play, we're attracted out of our own volition. We're joining into the athletics, wanting to be like them, emulating their ways. Once you come along and say, 
you are no longer allowed to circumcise your son. You are no longer allowed to keep Shabbos. Then you're touching something very deep in the Jewish psyche. Don't tell me what to do. There's a small group led by a man, Matis Yahu. Matis Yahu called that group the Maccabees. The word Maccabee in Greek means hammer. In Talmudic literature, it's also an acronym for Mi Kamocha Be'ilim Hashem, who is strong besides God. It was their declaration that we don't care about the Greek army and the elephants. The elephants were the tanks of those times. We don't care about that. We believe there's a master of the universe who is controlling what takes place here in our reality. And therefore, Matis Yahu and his five sons got together, they joined, and they tried to get others to join with them to fight the Greeks. There is one turning point here in the beginning of the revolt. The book of the Maccabees relates that the king's officials who were in charge of making sure no Torah was being practiced anywhere in Jerusalem. They came to the town of Modian to make them sacrifice, to make them sacrifice swine to one of their gods. Many Israelites came up to meet them, and Matis Yohu and his sons were brought into the gathering. The king's officials addressed Matis Yohu as follows, quote, You are a respected and distinguished leader in this town supported by his sons and kinsmen. Now you be the first to come forward and obey the command of the king, as all the Gentiles have done, as well as the people of Judah, and those who have been allowed to remain in Jerusalem. Putting on the pressure. You're the leader here. Everybody looks up to you. They respect you. You're going to be the first one to take this pig and sacrifice it to Zeus like many of your brothers have done throughout the land of Israel. <laughs> yeah, which was true. Right? Many people gave in. I'm not going to fight. I don't want to risk my life. In return, you and your sons will be raised to the rank of friends of the king, and you and your sons will be honored by grants of silver and gold and many gifts. Why did they care so much to get Matis Yo and his sons on their team? If you're the leader, they're going to listen to you. Matis, Matis Yo replied in a loud voice, If all the Gentiles under the king's rule listen to his order to depart from the religion of their fathers and choose to obey his commands, nevertheless, I and my sons and my kinsmen shall follow the covenant of our fathers. Far be it from us to desert the Torah and the laws. We shall not listen to the words of the king that we should transgress against our religion to the right or to the left. In other words, go jump in the lake. When he had finished uttering these words, a Jewish man came forward in the sight of all to sacrifice upon the altar in Modian in accordance with the king's decree. So you have one man here, and he can't take the pressure. And he's nervous based on what Matthew just said, we're all going to die. So I want to show them that I'm on your team. Don't kill me. Don't kill my family. So he goes up. He volunteers. I'll be the first one. He takes the swine. When Matthew saw this, he was filled with zeal and trembled with rage and let his anger rise, as was fitting. Interesting line the book of the Maccabees throws in. It's a judgment, as was fitting. He ran and slew him upon the altar. His fellow Jew is going to sacrifice this swine to an idol. Matis Yahu is filled with rage. He goes and he kills this Jew. He falls dead upon the altar. At the same time, he also killed the king's official in charge of enforcing sacrifices, and he destroyed the altar. He acted zealously for the sake of the Torah, as Pinchas acted against Zimri, the son of Solom. Now here you are, picture yourself being in this crowd of people, and you just witnessed this. Matis Yahu kills this other Jew, and then he kills the officer in charge. What's going to happen now to your little village? Once word gets back, decimated. 
So at this point, you flee. And that's what they did. They left Modian, and at that point, they really began the Maccabees. Matis Yohu himself lives to be an old man and dies in his bed. That was not common during this period, to die in your bed. The norm was to die in the battlefield. But we have recorded here in the book of the Maccabees some of his last words that he conveys to his sons. Now he has five sons, Yochanan, Shimon, Yehuda, Elazar, and Yonatan. The five sons of Matis Yehu, the most famous, Yehuda HaMaccabee, Judah the Maccabee. On his deathbed, he says, Now arrogance has grown strong and outrage. It is a time of calamity and a fierce anger. Therefore, my children, be zealous for the Torah and be ready to give your lives for the covenant of our fathers. And then he goes on to give a brief synopsis of all of Jewish history. Remember Abraham. Remember Joseph. Remember Pinchas. Remember David, Elijah. Going through all of our great personalities showing them that if you don't stand for nothing, you are nothing. If you're not willing to die for a cause, you're not living for any cause. My children, be, res be resolute for the Torah, because through the Torah will you win glory. Your brother Shimon, or Simon, I know, is a man of counsel. Always listen to him. He shall serve as your father. So here, Matas Yoh appoints Shimon as the leader. He's the Chacham, he's the wise man amongst you. However, Yehuda has been a mighty warrior from his youth. He shall be commander of your army and shall fight the war against the nations. So Shimon is appointed as the leader, the one to give counsel. Yehuda is appointed as the warrior, the commander in this battle. Yes? Are they beneath it? They were Kohanim. They were Kohanim. Which actually fits very well with the personality of a Kohen. The Talmud says that Kohanim are zealous. They're antsy. Got to get the job done. There you have it. So from this point on, we have the major battles that take place, the guerrilla warfare, Yudha HaMaccabee leading the way. Three years into the battle against the Greeks, they drive them out of the temple and they regain Jerusalem. That's the story of Hanukkah right there, that point in time. Taking out the idols, trying to put things back together, purifying all of the utensils used for the worship in the temple and lighting the menorah. The menorah was lit every day as part of the temple service. To light the menorah, you need that flask of oil. They found one flask that was not yet contaminated, had, had the, the seal of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, and they used that. In the meantime, they went to get more olive oil, and that's the miracle we all learn about in school. It was enough oil for one day, and through a miracle it lasted eight days. Eight days was enough time for them to produce new olive oil, and then they would continue lighting the menorah every day afterwards. The war was not over. The war went on for years afterward. We look back in history, and we think of the miracle of Hanukkah. What was the greatest miracle of Hanukkah? Was it the fact that one flask of oil was lit for eight days. That's pretty cool. That's a neat trick. Getting back the temple, defeating the Greek army, the most powerful army in the face of the earth. It's like you and I saying, "Come, let's get together and we'll get some, uh, go to buy some guns and we'll fight." You know, the the U.S. Army. What are you doing? That's the greatest miracle that took place: the military victory. There was almost like a side miracle with the oil lasting for longer than it should have. Let's say that oil only lasted for one day instead of eight. What would have happened? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nothing major. We would have been disappointed, but we would have went on with life, and we had the temple, and we'll get more oil in eight days from now. What's the big deal? That's 
I mean, the, the tactics they used were guerrilla warfare. It wasn't lining up and trying to defeat them on the battlefield. But it's hiding out. What's that? Right, it wasn't like they destroyed the entire Greek army. They annoyed them enough to just say, you know what, it's not worth it, let's just leave. That itself is a miracle. But it wasn't taking down the entire Greek army. But that was a much greater miracle than the oil lasting for eight days. Yet, the celebration of Hanukkah seems to be focused more on the lighting of the menorah. That has become the symbol of Hanukkah. Why is that? If the real celebration is the fact that we were alive and were able to get back the temple and practice our religion and freedom, that should be the celebration. So I'll explain to you something, and this gets back into our initial question of how do miracles work. There are two types of miracles. The Ramban, Nachmanides, makes this point going back to the 1200s. There's a Nes Nister and a Nes Nigla. There are hidden miracles and then there are revealed miracles. Hidden miracles happen every second of our lives. The fact that we're sitting here together, we're able to communicate. The billions and billions of neurons that are somehow working together to allow me to speak and you to listen, that's a miracle. The fact that we're breathing, the fact that our heart is beating, every aspect of the human body is a miracle. It's not a revealed miracle. A revealed miracle is something that doesn't happen often. It doesn't work with the, the flow of nature. What's a greater miracle, a hidden miracle or a revealed miracle? The splitting of the sea was a revealed miracle. Usually water doesn't split like that. The answer is objectively, qualitatively, they're both the same level. Miracle means that the creator of the universe is running the show, is infusing life, infusing light, infusing everything that we know in existence. That's happening every second. We're more phased we're more shocked by a revealed miracle because we're not accustomed to that. Usually water is like this. It doesn't split. So when we see that, oh, wow, that's incredible. But if you were to have aliens come down from outer space and they went back 3,300 years ago, right at that moment, the Jews are standing there by the raging sea, the Egyptian army is approaching, and then Nachshon ben Aminadov steps into the water, nothing happens, he's going further in, nothing's happening until he gets right over here and then at that moment the water splits and aliens see that and they come back and they tell their children and their friends, you won't believe what we saw, it was pretty cool, the water split, okay, neat. They come back a little while later and they see a mother is giving birth to a child and they're, they're watching this process. Of, of a new life coming into the world through another humanoid and they come back and they tell their friends what happened what's more of a shocking experience seeing the water split in half or seeing a human being come into this world from another human being I would argue birth <coughs> we see it every day it doesn't phase us so they're hidden miracles and they're revealed miracles Anytime you have a war, no matter how miraculous it is, no matter how many elephants they have, that's always a hidden miracle. Because you could always look back and say, well, we were very strategic. Yehuda HaMakabi was a great commander. And the Greek army was foolish and they made many mistakes. The miracle of the oil is a revealed open miracle. You can't deny that. The gratitude is for the military victory. But the way to remind ourselves every year that what we're celebrating was also the hand of God is through doing that which commemorates the revealed miracle, which is the miracle of the oil. This we can't deny. That's miraculous. And through seeing the hidden things in life, or rather through seeing the revealed miracles in life, then that brings our attention to everything that else is a miracle as well. There's a famous question which is interesting Talmudic mind. Why do we have eight days of Hanukkah? 
How many days were miraculous of that oil lasting? Seven. It was enough oil for one day. So we should have seven days of Hanukkah. It was seven days of miracle. There are many, many, many answers to this question. But I'll share with you one very powerful one. Rav Simcha Zizel of Kelm, who was the head of the yeshiva in Kelm in pre-war Europe, he said the following. He said, we're celebrating the seven days where the oil lasted longer than it should have, but we're also celebrating the fact that oil burns. That itself is a miracle. It's that same idea. We're looking at the revealed miracle to remind ourselves of everything else in life is also a miracle. That eighth day of Hanukkah is saying we're celebrating the reality that oil burns. That's also miraculous. Now, what happens afterwards here, the great revolt of the Maccabees, and years later, Yochanan and Yehuda both die in battle, two out of the five sons of Matis Yahu. Later on, Elazar dies in battle. We actually have a description of his death. An elephant falls on him. That's how he dies. And we have two sons left over. We have uh, Shimon and Yonatan. Yonatan becomes the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. And during that time, although they have the temple back, there were always conflicts with the Greeks. He's invited to a banquet. And he assumes that it's through political friends and people he can trust. At the banquet, though, he's given over to the Greek generals. And he's taken for a hostage. And they basically demanded the Jews in Jerusalem to allow the Greeks to come back with peace, not to keep on fighting them, or else we kill Yonatan. At that point, Shimon tries to arrange a group and go in there and save him. It's not successful. Because they deny the request of the Greeks, they end up executing Yonatan in public, public execution. At that point, Shimon takes over. Shimon is now the only brother of the five who's still alive. He takes over as the high priest, and he also takes the monarchy. He becomes the king as well. This is something totally new. Until this point, there have always been two distinct positions. You have the king, and you have the high priest. The king's job in general is more political, the high priest is in charge of the spiritual realm. Shimon takes both positions. Now, he was a righteous man. He was beloved by any, everybody there. The Sanhedrin, the leading authorities, rabbinic authorities, felt that he was very worthy of, of both positions. But at the same time, they didn't like the fact that he had both positions. What's the problem with being king and Kohen Gadol? They don't have those checks and balances. With him, he was able to do it. His son was not. His son is Yochanan Hurkinus, and that doesn't end pretty. His grandson is Alexander Janius. These names are sounding more and more Greek. And what happens is, within a time span of less than 100 years, the Maccabees, righteous, holy, devoted group of men standing up for Jewish pride no longer exist. The Talmud says that we know for sure every human being, men, women, and children of the Hashmonaim of that family were killed out to the degree that if someone claims I'm from the Hashmonaim, you can know for sure he's a servant. He's not really from the Hashmonaim. So what happened? Matis Yahu and his children saved the world. They saved Judaism. 100 years go by, no more Maccabees, no more Hashmanayim. So the Ramban is bothered by this question. And he says, it's the failure to recognize your place. You could save the Jewish people. You could bring everyone together get the temple back, 
But when you take a position that doesn't belong to you, things will not stay secure. That leadership will not stay secure. You took too much power. That was the mistake of the Maccabees. So it's interesting when we celebrate Hanukkah, we don't think about the hundreds of years leading up to that moment. We don't think about the century that comes afterwards. It's that one slice in time that we're celebrating, and therefore, our initial question is very, very strong. What are we celebrating? It was one little battle. We got the temple back. We felt good about ourselves for that moment. 100 years later, the Maccabees are gone. 200 years later, the temple is destroyed. So we lost the war. What's the celebration of Hanukkah? It's almost like saying we should have a holiday for the Warsaw Uprising. Let's celebrate that. So on one hand, we can be proud of them and feel that it took courage to stand up and try to defend your lives. But that was not a joyous occasion. They were ultimately defeated and many Jews were killed. The same thing is true with Hanukkah. Any ideas? Yeah? Well, the victory can be attributed to you know, the, you know, doing the right thing in Modin, you know, and, and their downfall can be attributed to, them, to the family eventually doing the wrong thing. So the victory can still be rewarded because it's saying that, look, if you do right, Hashem will be, um, you know, Hashem will support you. And, that's, and, and that was, uh, that was uh, confirmed. You can, you can celebrate that. I mean, the celebration is not so much the fact that we were saved, but we're celebrating their decision. So we're celebrating that Hashem did, you know, support us. And, you know, we did great, and Hashem did support us, just like before said. Okay. Very similar to what the Bach writes. The Bach, one of the great commentators in the 1600s, he says there's a very fundamental distinction between the holiday of Purim and the holiday of Hanukkah. And we celebrate those holidays in very different ways. We always eat plenty of food. Is it a humantashen? Is it a larka? It doesn't make a difference. We eat all the time. But there's still a difference in how we celebrate. Purim, it's much more physical. You have an obligation to have a festive meal. You get together with family. You have an obligation to drink. Hanukkah, there's no official obligation to have a festive meal. We light candles. We sing songs. Very different celebrations, explains the Bach, because there were two threats that were really polar extremes. The threat at the time of Purim with Achashverosh. Achashverosh said, based on Haman's prodding, I don't care what level religiosity a Jew is, I don't care if they view themselves as Jew or Gentile, anyone with Jewish blood I want dead. That was the plot of Haman and Achashverosh. So the lives of every Jewish human being was in danger. Therefore, the celebration in Purim is a physical one. We were saved physically. Let's celebrate through the, the goof, the body. In the times of Hanukkah, if you were to go to the Greeks and say, we want to embrace Hellenism, we want to be just like you, we're doing that, that surgery to, to, to reverse the circumcision so we can look and play sports just like you, they would have welcomed us with open arms. They didn't want to kill you because you were biologically Jewish. And they didn't want you to practice Judaism. If you would throw that away, okay, welcome to the club. So the threat was never a physical one. It was a spiritual one. And therefore, the celebration during Hanukkah is more of a spiritual celebration. So we're not looking back into history and saying, we're so happy because we beat them. That's great we beat them. The main thing we're celebrating is that we were able to stand up for Judaism. We didn't just go into the night and fade away and say, I don't want to risk my life. I'm willing to give my life for what I believe in. Now picture for a moment if you were actually living in 165 BCE and you get a phone call from Matis Yohu, who is your uncle. Jean, we're fleeting right now from Modian, going into the hills, trying to gather a few good men together for the, 
the cause of Judaism. Please leave your wife and children behind and join us. What's your response? I'm so happy you're doing that and the best of luck to you. I gotta run. Any anybody here? <laughs> I can't take it at home anyways, so I'll join you. Anyone here you think you would have joined Matis Yahu? To risk your life and and your family's life. Say not living enough time, right? right. When you get the phone call, you're sitting in your living room and your five children are right there playing dreidel. And you know by joining Matis Yahu and his clan, you're endangering all of your lives. Do you say yes? There's also the point of saying if you say no, then they could come in there and rape and kill you anyway. Yeah, there's that. Who's going to trust them? They, they could, but it yeah, sounds like... Not how, many people, trust how many people have you seen killed, you know, within the past few weeks? I mean, that's a contributing factor. But again, why were they killed? Were they killed because they were Jewish? Was it a Holocaust? They were killed because they were practicing Judaism. Every account we have in the book of the Maccabees is when they were caught during circumcision, killed. Caught studying Torah, killed. Oh, so the question is, would we have been stubborn enough to join Matis Yahu, to join Yehuda? Now, it's a question that we have to ask ourselves, even 2014, Boca Raton, Florida. Thank God we don't have that issue right here in the front burner. But the question is a serious one. Is there anything that I'd be willing to risk my life for? Not any person. Is there any ideology? Is there any philosophy that I'd be willing to risk my life for? If the answer is no, then we have to ask ourselves the question, if I'm not willing to die for anything, what am I really living for? If I'm not living for anything beyond myself to the point that I would give my life for that purpose, so what's life about? It's a big question. into that Jewish soul, there was almost something within you where you were thriving on the fact that people were saying, don't do it. Absolutely. Don't tell me what to do. If I want to go to Israel in the middle of the war, you're going to watch me go to Israel. And he can tell That's right. I never, I was like, I'm gone. <laughs> there was no doubt that's the, that's the Jewish spark. We're stubborn. I'd like to share with you, because I think this gets back to our initial question. The question we started off with was, when or why do miracles actually take place? We've established the history of what led up to Hanukkah, the revolt of the Maccabees, and their decline. We've established the main celebration is standing up for Judaism, not just assimilating into the culture around us. And therefore, it's very relevant at every moment in our lives. That war is still raging. We've established the idea that there are two types of miracles. There is the nace nigla and the nace nister. There is the hidden miracles that happen all the time. And then we have the revealed miracles. And the way to tune in to the hidden ones is by paying attention to the revealed ones. Now back to our initial question, which was, but why and when do miracles happen? So I want to share with you, there's something we find in Kabbalistic sources. 
and it's a term that's used all over Talmudic and Midrashic sources. The term is Mesiris Nefesh, which literally means giving your life. Now, you can give your life in one of two ways. You could give your life literally, as Matis Yahu was willing to do. I'm standing up for what I believe in, and therefore, even if you're threatening to kill me, it's not going to faze me. Or you could give your life through living a life of devotion. I'm giving everything that I have to this cause. Right? There's two ways to give your life. So we find a Kabbalistic sources that when a person goes beyond that which is normal, that which is expected, if you break through the barriers of the illusion of this world, then you're no longer limited by the illusions of this world. If you could see beyond some of those restrictions, oh, we can't do that. That's beyond me. I would never be able to accomplish that. If you could see beyond those made-up limitations, then you're no longer subjugated by them. I'll give you an example. A true story that took place in World War II, the Briskorov, one of the greatest Jewish minds at the time, a very well-known rabbinic authority, he was at the time living in Warsaw. One day he sees in the newspaper, something's happening, he makes the decision to travel back to Brisk was impossible. The only hope they had was to go from Warsaw to Vilna. Now how do you get from Warsaw to Vilna in the middle of World War II? And he looked very Jewish. So to take a train is suicide. Gestapo is there, they're going to find you in four seconds. So the, the Soloveitchik family, the Briskorov and his family, together with another family, they hired a wagon driver, a Polish non-Jewish guy, to take them from Warsaw to Vilna. That journey itself should have taken about four or five days. But the, reading the story, and there are many accounts of the story, it was an amazing, very miraculous journey. It took about two weeks, so they finally got to a half a mile away from the border to Vilna. Now, the whole time they're in the wagon, Reb Chaim, the Briskorov, he's in the back with blankets on top of him so no one would see his face, clearly recognizing he was a Jew. There was a point, though, where no wagons were allowed. You would have to get out and walk that half a mile to the border. They get out, him together with his family and the other family, and they start walking. Four seconds or so after they start walking towards the border, two SS officers approach him and they say, the line they said often, show me your gun, show me your money, and they start harassing him. As that's taking place, a third officer comes by, clearly a higher ranking officer, and says something in German, he yells at these two fellows, Lene! and they left him alone. They continued walking, they got to the border going into Vilna. As they crossed over the border, Rav Chaim turns to his family and says, I know what happened. They were in shock. It's an open miracle. Two SS officers find a Jew trying to escape. You're dead on the spot. There's no chance of survival. The Briskorov said, I know what happened. The whole time in the wagon, I kept on repeating a line in my head, Ein od milvado, which is a line from the Torah itself, which means there is nothing besides the Creator. That was his way of transcending the illusion of nature. I'm not going to be fooled by what appears to be outside. I'm focusing in on the reality that God runs the world. Nothing can phase me. Everything is in your control. So for two weeks, I'm repeating that line over and over again. As soon as we get out, and I see the light at the end of the tunnel. So at that point, his Hebrew phrase was, I was Masiach Das. I stopped thinking about it for a moment. At that second, these two fellows came over to me. When they started to harass me, I ignored them. I went back into my trance, Ein Od Milvado. At that moment, the third fellow came along. There are many stories similar to this. 
There are many stories that don't have happy endings. But it's a wonderful illustration of the potential of transcending what seems to be limitations based on seeing through it, based on being willing to go beyond what's normal. That was the miracle of Hanukkah. It's because the Maccabees and those who joined them, at their highest point, they only had 30,000 people, which was nothing, which was a tiny fraction of the Jewish population. But that small group of Jews gathering together, living the mysterious nefesh, devoting their lives, not for anything selfish, not for my family, not for my pride, for Judaism. To be able to raise children and grandchildren who appreciate the Torah and who live by Torah values. So what they were doing is, they were being mesiris nefesh, they were devoting their lives to that cause. That was the source of the miracle. All of the famous miracles we read about in the Tanakh, it all starts from that first perspective of the human being. I'm seeing beyond the present. That's what happened by the splitting of the Red Sea. The Jews are standing there, raging sea in front of them, charging Egyptian army behind, everyone screaming out, what do you do when you're Moshe, you're the leader? You turn to Hashem, please God, help us! What's God's answer to Moshe? Lama titzak Why are you calling out to me? It's a strange answer. What else am I supposed to do? I'm going to build a boat? So the Orachayim explains, one of the Hasidic commentators quoting from the Zohar, God's answer was, now is not a time to pray. Now is a time to transcend your illusion. Go into the sea. If you show me that you see more than meets the eye, if you're willing to go beyond what seems to be your boundary, then the supernatural will happen. And that's what took place. The first man to go in, Nachshon ben Aminadav, he transcends that illusion, he goes into the sea, and at that moment, the sea splits. Rav Chaim Velazhin, the great disciple of the Vilna Gon, he says, people are always looking for segulas. Segula means some kind of almost magical way of getting wealthy, or protection, or healing somebody. Always looking for magical solutions. He writes, I only know of one segula. And that is, thinking to yourself, and not just saying the words, but reinforcing the belief, Ein od milvado. There is nothing else besides the creator of the universe. Nothing else can touch me. If you're able to really get on that plane of existence, you are not limited by things in the physical realm. That's the way to achieve a miracle. That's what the Maccabees did. That's what the Jews did to cross the Red Sea. That's what Rav Chaim Brisker did to be saved from the war. That's the one way we know how we ourselves can create miracles. That's the celebration of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is celebrating the choice that they made and the choice that we continue to make. The battle is still raging. We no longer have the Greeks. They're long gone. But we have a secular culture. We have so many ideas that are so foreign to Judaism. So many values. We don't have modesty. We don't have authenticity. We don't have honesty. There are so many things lacking even in our American society. The war is still raging. The celebration is as we light the menorah, we think to ourselves, I want to be part of that team. In every generation, only a small group of Jews were able to stand up above the rest and say, I don't care what everyone else is doing. I defend truth. I'll risk my life for the truth. That's Hanukkah. Any questions? Okay. Have a wonderful and joyous Hanukkah. All right. Yes.